All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for an idea scale webinar. Today, we're joined by Dr. Brian Beam Mao, who will be sharing the framework, tools, and memorable success stories about how leaders successfully and sometimes unsuccessfully sense and shape the future. This will be an hour long webinar, and a recording will be sent out afterwards to all registrants. Um, additionally, we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. We have a Q&A functionality at the bottom of the screen there. Um, and then we also have a chat open for other discussions. If you want to test it out, you can say hi in there. You can share where you're joining from. Um, I'm joining today from Washington, D.C. Um, Beam, where are you joining us from? Ah, today, my friends, I come to you from the great state of Michigan, Detroit, Lansing. I'm up here now in my retirement town, if you will, of Manistee, a town of 6,000 strong in northern Michigan. Welcome, everybody. All right, and I will briefly kick things off just by going over who IdeaScale is and what we do. Um, we empower organizations to harness crowdsourcing to drive innovation. Um, we're government industry leaders, and we're actually one of the few um, FedRAMP certified innovation management platforms. We're established um, by a White House initiative, and we've been helping organizations transform their culture for almost 15 years. Um, we host these webinars as a space for innovators to connect, share best practices. We have other events. Um, and yeah, we just want to learn from each other. And that's why we're here. So today, we welcome Dr. Brian Beam Mao. As you can see, he is very accomplished. Um, he was in the uniform service. He uh, now is a transformation architect at Principal Tier 1 Performance Consulting. And he was a startup leader and co-founder of AFWorks, the Air Force Innovation Arm. And now I will, oh, sorry, one second, stop sharing my screen. We will launch a quick innovation poll just to get us all thinking. Um, and then we'll pass things over to Beam. So one second, let us get that poll launched. All right, this is an innovation warm up. So if you can answer the questions on your screen and scroll down for number three, it's a little hidden there. Um, one would be how many thought experiments and physical experiments did Thomas Edison and his team accomplish before they had created a desirable light bulb? All right. Two, how many compositions did Mozart create in his lifetime? Oh, and I can see everyone voting. Thank you. And three, how many single works of art, or sorry, how many works of art did Picasso create in his lifetime? And I'll give you a couple more seconds to answer those just to get us thinking and then we'll pass things over. Oh, I'm seeing all the answers come in. Okay. All right, I'm going to end the poll now and share the results. All right, so that's right. Um, it did take more than 3000 experiments for Thomas Edison. Mozart um, had more than 600 compositions and Picasso created more than 3,650 works of art, which is pretty insane numbers. So with that, I will pass things over to Beam. Thank you for joining us today. Awesome. Well, thank you for that, Lizzie. Welcome, everybody. Uh, from around the globe, it looks like, from the people chiming in. So this is fantastic. Super excited to be here with you today and uh, share a little bit of the insights because uh, where you joined in with the poll that's that's all about persistence and persistence is like the first factor of innovation success. The complementary factor to persistence then, the important second factor is adaptive intelligence. And with adaptive intelligence, we're gonna be able to sense and shape uncertain futures. So fired up to uh, be here with you today. Now, uh, in about one minute from now, we're gonna do a little experiment. So depending on when you signed up, you may or may not have received a PDF that had kind of four different boxes put together on it. So if you haven't yet, basically what we're going to do, and you don't have to have typing paper, but you could do typing paper, you could do line paper. We've got an item. And in fact, it even fits, sorry, real-time adjustment right here. <laughs> These two circles that you see are pretty much the size of a standard sticky note apart. So it's about two inches apart of the size of your thumb. And each of these circles is about half an inch or a little bit smaller than your thumbnail. One is a ring and one is a filled in splotch circle. So in about a minute, we're gonna do a visual trick with this that uh, both your kids and your uh, coworkers might get a kick out of that and it actually has a deeper point to it. So if you haven't seen it yet, you might wanna just quick down pencil. I've seen people do it on the fly before. Uh, half an inch, a circle ring, and then a circle filled in splotch that's about two inches apart or about 
the diagonal crossing of a typical sticky note pad. So with that in mind, uh, let's jump on a little bit further. And just to be sure, for those of you who are new to Zoom or haven't played around in a while, um, if I could just get a real quick way of us doing an informal poll for a couple of the questions that we're going to have today. Can I see by a show of hands, because I can see it on the participant side, do you prefer stories? Who likes stories? Can I can I get a raising of the hands with regard to the stories? Look at all those hands. Fan, it's great to see everything's working. That's cool. Great. So before we're done, hopefully you're going to have at least a dozen two minute or less stories that can ca capture attention and allow things to happen for you and make it things better at your organization. So fired up about that. Okay, with that in mind, let's begin our stories. Our stories begin right here with a scenario I'm sure many of you have seen before. Car A is in the lead, coming into car B's lane and car A's driver doesn't see car B, didn't look over the shoulder the whole bit. In response, the driver of car B usually says something like, Behold, you are committing a blind spot error. And you know, you could hurt us both. I too have committed a similar act in the past. And so I honk my horn to you in empathetic solidarity. At least I, I think that's what they're saying, but there's definitely some mouthing of words and the hitting of the horn, but I'm gonna go with empathetic solidarity on that. Uh, but it's important because people get really nervous about this because a blind spot could literally kill you and within an organizational or a team context, blind spots mean that there are threats coming that we aren't looking for them. Blind spots mean that there are opportunities that we're gonna miss. So we really wanna hone in on blind spots and that takes us to the experiment of the day. My friends, I'm gonna say up front, 60 to 70% of all people have been able to do this and I've done this 18 times now. Uh, but for the 30% who don't catch it the first time, I was part of that 30%, so don't feel bad. We're only going to spend two minutes on it, but I'm going to walk you through it. Uh, and then you can work on it until it comes together. And when it does, it kind of feels a little magical. So like the screen that you have in front of you, we've got our card. Again, there's a ring and then there's the splotch. So like the slide says, you're going to take your left hand, cover up your left eye, and then with your right eye, take that ring and put the ring right next to your nose with the card. And then as you push away, from your, from your uh, head straight away, look only at the ring. And that's gonna be really hard because eyes are designed to scan left and right by, by, by design. So that's a little tricky, but if you can relax your eye long enough. So again, left hand covers left eye. And then as you push away, when you bring the card back, if you're relaxed and looking only at the ring, somewhere between 13 and nine inches, depending on your body makeup, your face, your eyes, all of that, somewhere something kind of magical happens. Right about here, the whole splotch disappears. You might see little rainbowy little speckles. It might actually, if you catch it just right, the whole thing goes white. Your peripheral visions compensate for it and everything goes just white. And then as you bring it closer in, you'll be able to see everything in your peripheral vision again. And then as you push away, there's that magic spot. And then as you push away farther, even though you're looking, your peripheral picks in the splotch. And so what's going on there? Well, first, what you have happening is in the back of your eye, as the light comes in, you've got the rods, the cones, the sensors, but at that one spot where you have the optic nerve that sends all that information back to your brain for development, um, that is where you don't have enough sensors and that's an actual blind spot. We've had it our whole lives. We've got two blind spots, two eyes, but because of the constant scanning, the dimension of the eyes, we're able to compensate for it. So what's kind of interesting then is this physical event sets up a metaphor for how we can conquer blind spots within our own uh, organizational and team settings. More specifically, to solve for a blind spot, when you need a breakthrough, refocus how you view. For us, physically, it's been going out and coming in. And so we're gonna go through the layers that'll help us overcome blind spots within our own organizations. Now, there are going to be some blind spots that we might want to call ghosts even because you've grown up with them. And since we're from all across the globe, this should be kind of interesting as we look at a couple of the examples. Uh, for example, if you think back to the Cold War era uh, from the 1900s between the U.S. and what was then called the Soviet Union, after World War II, there was some serious potential for mutual assured destruction using nuclear forces. And when you think about the Soviet Union, 
and you think about Gary Kasparov and all the great chess champions out there, think about what the game of chess has meant for the Soviet culture. In specific, chess begins with two armies on opposite sides of the board. And at the end of the day, as we make our way over to the right side of the screen, it's about attrition and who's left over that can actually capture the other person's king. This is very similar to the foreign policy of mutual assured destruction, where you had two competing nuclear superpowers that were like, well, you can blow me up, but I bet you I can attrit you too, and eventually I'll take over your capital. A really interesting ghost that the game shows you the culture that actually grows into foreign policy. In contrast, think about China and what might be the world's oldest board game, Go. Unlike chess that begins with the armies on opposite sides, in the game of Go, we start out with a blank board, and then through the placement of your pegs, you try and control the area. Well, for those of you who have been following China's foreign policy for the last 10 years, it's called One Belt, One Road. Doesn't look like attrition at all, but instead it looks like these trading routes and economic relationships and control the board. So again, is it which came first? The game, the culture, the culture influenced the game, the game influenced the culture. It is a, a powerful ghost that we want to look through kind of like a blind spot. Similarly, uh, our European friends would have one way of saying football, and our American friends would have another way of saying football. So whether you're the Yankee style or the European style, uh, one version of football finds itself where most of the players have the same capabilities. You can only use your feet, you can use your head. Uh, there is a goalie that allows you some specialization of labor. In contrast, in American football, which comes in after soccer, in American football, we have a large division and specialization of labor. And America itself was formed under specialization of labor. Uh, dig out your 1776 copy of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. Coming out of the Enlightenment, the importance of the specialization of labor finds its way into many of our sports teams. So you can see some cultural differences and you can find a, a greater propensity of governments to be a little bit more egalitarian over in Europe, a little more socialized medicine and those types of aspects, as opposed to the United States, which has a, a higher um, a higher premium on the, the liberty or slanting towards that side to, to go off. And if there are disparate impacts, well, that's just the specialization of the choice that you chose. So things to think about just at the, the national level. And just for fun, for the chat now or for the chat at the end where we're into Q&A, can you think about a childhood game and what the leftover ghost lesson might have been and what it taught you? For example, another thing game that they play around here a lot in America, some version of a card game. And often it's based upon bluffing or deception. You hold your cards and you make statements or things and you try, you know, try and fool your players as you do different card games and stuff like that. So uh, think about as we're going along here today and throw it into the chat anytime, what kind of game may have influenced you or what kind of ghost or bias or blind spot lesson is sitting in the game that could be affecting the way you're acting today? Because ultimately, we want to get rid of the ghosts and we want to have a unity of vision. And ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to uh, Rosebud and Buttercup, our two cats looking out upon the frozen Michigan tundra. But what a peaceful vision, right? We've got our players and they all have a common landscape of where they want to be and what they want to do. And oh, right. Yeah, not all that because, you know, cats are cats. And we have this thing called VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. And once you get people that have, or creatures or beings that have their own autonomous thoughts, you can expect to see some VUCA, whether it's at the team, organizational, national level, individuals can break up any unity of vision that's currently out there. And so I wanna go a little bit deeper and then we'll be ready to jump into the, the main portion of our presentation because we need this background on VUCA just a little bit more. Uh, I'm not a big fan of nickety-knack terms where you're fighting over one word or another, but I am a fan of intellectual precision, so I want to be very intellectually precise with you to set this up, specifically with regard to the terms complicated and complex. Okay, complicated. My marathon watch, crazy complex. It's got all sorts of diodes and buttons and little things on it that are moving all around, so heart rates and distance traveled and GPS uploads and all that great stuff. But at the end of the day, it's all very predictable. Once you know how the gizmo works, you can predict how it's gonna end up. For example, if I can take this off, 
and drop it into an AI cloud and, and it can read every spot and button that I have. And then I put in the owner's manual and we put in the mechanical specs. Any good computer would be able to say, oh, I can predict where every button or gizmo within this watch will be one hour from now because it works like clockwork, right? In a linear, predictable way. Great thing when you have a machine that's linear and predictable, you can depend on it, you know how it's gonna play out. But when we get into the complex, much like the cats on my windowsill, now we have autonomous, heterogeneous, they don't all think alike, agents or actors that occur in non-linear ways. And it's not particularly uh, guided by a master architect. The cats don't come to me in the morning and say, gee, dad, what are we gonna do? Uh, in the same way, an ant colony, is kind of self-organized without a master architect. All the ants do not huddle in the morning and say, hey, Fred, take 25% of the ants and build out the ant colony to the north. Jeff, take care of the guardian function. In the they just get up and start going once they have the energy. And it blows the mind of people who watch because somehow this ant colony still keeps going. So they must be organizing somehow. And maybe a hint of that can be found within geopolitics and our globe. Because there is no actual master architect of the globe. Now we've got uh, the United Nations, we've got the Hague, we have places where we can definitely meet and hold summits to try and come to some consensus agreements, but there's no master architect. So that's playing out every day in our complex environment. And one of the unique features about co complex environments is called the emergent property. And emergence is a crazy thing because uh, we'll start with chemistry. An atom of hydrogen at room temperature, it's a gas. An atom of oxygen, room temperature, it's a gas. But somehow, when you bring together hydrogen and oxygen in a certain H2O kind of configuration, at room temperature, you have wetness. What? And the idea of emergence, again, is you've got individual components, but when brought together under the right conditions, there emerges a property that you would never know from those individual components. Or open up your dictionary of terms and your words, and as you surf, sift through over to car or automobile, you'll, you'll learn about that individual item. And as you sift over to road or pathway, you'll learn about that individual item, but you will not get to the emergent point of a traffic jam because that's not in the individual definition. So the trouble or the trick with complex systems is you have all these individual moving parts and all these emerging things that pop up that you couldn't plan for when you only saw the emerging parts, a lot of it begins with having the experience to be able to handle what's going to be emerging. So with that in mind, I want to talk about the adaptive intelligence that allows you to pick up what's going on in emerging and at times be able to leverage it and at least account for it. And for that, I'm going to give you what's called the flow model, the factors that link your organization's will, and I hope you look at it as a potential tool to add to your toolbox. We're going to cover the layers here. And I want to emphasize, again, as Lizzie was kind enough in her introduction to point out, um, this isn't just a theoretical model. This is the way I, as the leader of AFWorks, with an incredible group of people. I want to be very careful. When I use the term leader, it's more like shepherd of a great group of just geniuses that made things happen. But we put together an innovation organization for the Pentagon in 20, starting in 2017. And by 2020, we were ranked number 16 in the world by Fast Company as a best workplace for innovators. And along the left-hand column, you can see during that particular year, uh, our number 16 actually put us two in front of Amazon.com. So um, an amazing thing that happens. And this model was a large part of the structure. And I'll give you a couple of stories that came along with it. So flow, factors linking organizational will, is going to help explain how those same ingredients can sometimes emerge with a different outcome that you wouldn't have otherwise seen. Let's go surf some of that VUCA. If you're going to go out there and surf, uh, number one, if I could just please see by a show of hands, how many people are familiar with Peloton? The home bicycle, hands, hands. Excellent. Okay. So we won't go too deep. Simply put, imagine that you have the ability to put a bicycle, a stationary bicycle with a monitor, and you can hook up to other people uh, who are exercising on their stationary bikes all around the world. Peloton brings them together. And what you have on that chart up there is, as COVID was really starting to increase in the year of 2020, Peloton, wow, 
market value, uh, that's the stock price along the right, but as far as overall market with number of shares of stock times stock price, Peloton grew from over $5 billion as its initial point to a value of over $50 billion in market cap valuation. And they were definitely benefiting from the in-home exercise movement and all that came with it. So a big opening thing about the environment which within our flow model, the first VUCA thing we need to be looking at is that ever-changing environment because as Peloton shows us, the second year, as COVID started to wane a little bit and people started going outside a little bit, a Peloton dropped from a $50 billion market capitalization to $4 billion. And when I looked it up this week, they're at about $3.7 billion. Uh, and you saw a change out in Peloton's leadership in uh, 2022, 2023, in part because of a failure to properly read the environment and what those changes could mean to the organization. Military example, a military veteran myself from the US Air Force. 1957, Sputnik starts flying around the earth from, again, the Soviet Union at the time. And on the one hand, who cares that a little ball is out there rotating around the globe? Eh, it's a ball. But the deeper, and we'll use the precise term signal, associated with this ball that's spinning around the globe is, hey, that means the Soviets have rockets and guidance and the ability to put something around the globe. Wait a minute, they recently stole the US nuclear bomb secrets. How much longer until rockets plus guidance system plus nuclear capability means that they're gonna have a nuclear weapon that can strike anywhere around the world and they don't have to fly to drop it like we had to do in World War II, they can just launch it from their home bases. Like, wow. In response, if you were uh, in the Pentagon, and I don't think any of the gray beards would be there anymore, but you would find more than a few of the old crusty people who could tell you about, so you know the space race that the United States did in the 1960s? A large part of that was dual purpose of, hey, the US doesn't quite have the rockets with the guidance system to be able to land something precisely where we want it to. Oh, let's go to the moon. And along the way, we'll develop the rockets, the guidance systems to be able to take care of our nuclear forces. Myself, I actually served in that in the Air Force in the uh, Minuteman III ICBM system. So uh, I am an ancestor of this whole signal and response action. So level one for surfing VUCA, the environment. Uh, in total, I think there's about 10 steps the way I've seen it. There are many different models. I've just given you the major one here for number one, scanning for signals. That's a huge part of sensing. And now we're gonna spend the rest of our time talking about shaping the future. And that's more steps six through 10. But either A, I can do a follow-up conversation later if you reach out to me, or B, you could look up the words scenario planning, foresight, or futurism. And you can see some of the additional models if you wanna train up on how to engage and uh, predict the future. But from a really simple tactical thing, because that's part of what we want to do is give you something useful out of this, uh, you can just gather with your team once a month and everybody brings in a magazine article, a YouTube video, a clipping, a podcast, something that gives everybody a glimpse into what the future could look like that's relative to your organization, to your team, maybe it's parents, whatever that is for you. But having the lunch and learn and being an adaptive organization with intelligence, always trying to scan into the environment that can only build up your odds for better decision-making in the future. So we start to move in now on our flow model because it is hierarchical. And we say, you've had an environmental event. Now you need a mission and strategy in response to it. Obvious one would be from uh, World War II, where we had the United Nations, which the building in New York would later be named, right? The United Nations gathered with the allies in order to stop the Axis powers and what we had seen back then. And at the business level, a mission and strategy that we had was how many people here had the ability to rent a video from Blockbuster Video? I'm just curious what we have in the way of uh, age demographics here. How many people have, I see some hands going up. I see a lot of hands going, okay, so we're still, we're still relevant here. Before it was all just streaming, once upon a time, you actually had to go to a store if you wanted to rent a movie. And before the DVDs, it was this thing called the VCR tape, but that's another tale for another time, my young people. Uh, the key thing though, Blockbuster Video would grow to 8,000 stores and an $8 billion valuation as well with their mission and strategy of 
I need to deliver movies in a way that since you can't see it again in the movie theater, we're going to come into each of the neighborhoods and we're going to offer the ability for you to rent videos. So a great opening strategy there. So, but, and I want to say this because this is a common thing out in the business literature, certainly from my MBA days as well. You used to hear the expression, culture, it can eat strategy for breakfast. Number one, I absolutely agree. A toxic culture could nullify the best strategy in the world. And yet, we need to respect some of the hierarchy here because I did have a blockbuster video for many years, just within a mile or two of my home. And there was a manager and she was the greatest manager of all time. Somehow on Friday night, she seemed to still have a fully stocked new release shelf that most other stores didn't as I understand it. So she was amazing. It seemed like her team loved her, best culture in the world. And three years later, as streaming kicked off, she was unemployed like everybody else. So we should have some humility and be thinking also at the in a changing environment and a strategy that is not re, uh, responding to the environment. No matter how great your culture is, you're going to get wiped out. So there's a bit of a hierarchical model that we're trying to pursue here as we build up our strategic vision for how to sense and shape the future. There is a hierarchy to the factors linking organizational will. As for me slash the great AFWorks team, uh, we were actually given orders from our leadership, uh, which was at the time the Secretary of the Air Force, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, the highest ranking people in the Air Force that said, your mission is to drive innovation to secure our future. It's like, but the future's unknown, so how do I secure it? And I suspect many of you are actually living the ability to secure a VUCA future um, through your retirement funds. More specifically, we had a defense industrial base and we expanded it out. We expanded it out with the venture capital, small businesses, research, academia, other defense innovation groups. We really tried to build out our ecosystem in the same way. If you have a retirement fund, a 401k, you probably have a diversity of options. You probably have stocks, bonds, real estate, precious metals, all these index funds, different things that give you a diversity of things because at any one time, if you only have one egg in the basket and that egg goes bad, then you are, you know, without. So uh, the diversity of options is what gives you the ability to adapt, but you have to be out there expanding your option set, which is where the scanning of the future and the other items come in. So we talk about a grand ecosystem, stakeholder ecosystem, and part of AFWorks is opening mission during those three years. We connected, I believe in our database, 60,000 plus individuals from business, military, academia, um, which was very useful for being able to create innovative products for our Air Force. So we look for bumper sticker phrases when you talk about your mission and strategy. Uh, in the end, World War II, for the Allied powers, we had a two-word mission statement. I'm sorry, two-word strategy, because the, the mission was the defeat of the Axis powers, but the actual strategy was two words. And those two words were Europe first. We need to stop Hitler, and then we can take care of whatever we have to do in the in the Pacific. So um, a simple, you know, I, there's going to be the mission that you have on your website, but internally within your team, do you know your mission and strategy in a simple bumper sticker kind of phrase? Now, we come to that point where we say, wow, there's, there's a lot of uh, external scanning that needs to occur, sort of, because some of you are in more stable environments than others, but... I did ask Lizzie to um, help put together one other poll question. I'm just curious with the attendees that we have out here, uh, as the question states, hey, within the last six months, has your team or the larger organization, have they conducted an analysis of the future? Are you aware that there's some sort of strategic environment scanning going out there? An analysis of your mission statement or an analysis of your strategy and how you're going to be achieving the mission statement. Uh, you can check all that apply. Could you please just take 15 seconds and be like, yeah, I think we're doing that or nope, we haven't. And let's just get a feel. We've got over 50 people here today around the world with our innovative minds. And how many organizations are spending time doing this right now? Take about 10 more seconds and we'll look at the results. Okay, 
if we could close the poll and come up with the results, I actually can't see it on my screen. Oh, I can. How fantastic is that? That's great. Uh, we're seeing, for those of you, uh, I think everybody can see it, but 77% are doing something about the future, 68% uh, with regard to the mission, and 68% with regard to the strategy. That is fantastic to see. Uh, it's certainly different from when I was growing up under the old guard, so that's great to hear out there. Moving on. Now let's talk about culture, because here's a great two-minute story for you. Uh, if you haven't heard it before, or if you don't know the individual characters, it's the 1970s. It's Kodak, the research and development labs, and one of the inventors down there, Steve Sasson, comes to the review team and he's like, hey, I've got this box, this, this I'm going to call it a digital camera, and uh, I think it could be a new way of taking pictures. And the review board, and I'm paraphrasing now for sure, but the review board essentially said, uh, Steve, we are a film-based company, uh, you know, the Kodak moment, film, you've seen the commercials, right? Uh, and I can just imagine at the far end, the one reviewer, the sarcastic reviewer saying, uh, Steve, buddy, what are you doing there with this computery digital camera thing? What are you going to do? Are you going to are you going to add a rotary dial phone and record players so that you have uh, a camera that's both a music player and a phone, a camera that's a music player and a phone? Right. Sure, Steve. Again, it's the 1970s, so you can't have that same mindset that would be obvious to those of us who are walking around with those monster computers that fit within the palm, our palm or our pocket, but that's the way it is. Uh, a gift, a Christmas gift for you, if you want to see where Christmas slash culture could trump strategy, uh, I would invite you to look up the Christmas truce of 1914, or we can talk about it in Q&A afterwards. Now, for you as team leaders or just team members or parents, uh, remember the ghosts of positivity versus do not forget. Let me say it quicker and in a different way. I bump into Adam and I have something important I want Adam to remember. Version one. Hey, Adam, I know you are a flawed mortal. I know you forget stuff. Adam, I have something kind of important. Could you not be your flawed self here? Don't forget. Please don't forget what I'm about to tell you. Version two. Hey, Adam, dude, I need you to tap into your memory. That's right. The thing that put us at the top of the food chain, our ability to remember, our collective learning, and why we were able to grow out societies. This, this amazing function. I got something really important. Can you tap into your strength of memory here? Because this one's kind of important. Both are seeking the same consequence, but that path can make all the difference in energy. So where possible, as Ludwig Wittgenstein said, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. So if your language can be positive oriented based upon the strengths of your people, that creates a different kind of culture than the negative side of things. Or can you imagine if Steve Sasson going back to that review board, if in their head instead of Kodak, the film company, what if they had thought Kodak, the memory capture company? And now when Steve comes forward to talk to them and he's like, hey, I've got this thing and you can take like 30, 40 pictures at you can just look at them and then you can take another 30 or 40 pictures because memory wasn't that great in the 1970s for sure. But a very different story than when I was growing up in the 70s, it was film and maybe you got 12 shots or 20 shots within your camera and you didn't even know if they were any good. But because of that film-based mindset, it did not go well for the digital camera idea. A more modern example, I can recall from when I was driving home from the Air Force Academy teaching in their management department. And on the radio that day in 2007, when the guy came on the radio and he said, uh, Apple Computer is changing its name to Apple. And I thought, wow, that's that's kind of something. I wonder, I wonder what's up with that. You know, so, but with the Kodak story, it begins to make a little bit of sense because you can imagine Steve is walking through the halls of Apple and he hears somebody in one of the cubicles. Yeah, sure, Eve, I hear what you're saying. Your iPod, that's all sexy right now, but we're called Apple Computer. We're based on computers. Computers are the way. And you can just see it like, click, there would go Steve's head where he would then the next day hold this press conference and be like, the Mac, iPod, Apple TV, and iPhone, you can still find the quote out there today. Only one of those is a computer. So we're changing the name. And so that people didn't get crunched down into, we're just Apple Computer. We make computers. Steve changes the name, kind of big. 
that was in my head because I ultimately had to name what was the purpose, mission, statement, vision, whatever of AFWorks. And our opening line, I called us a fusion of capabilities. And then the ecosystem stuff who connect innovators and accelerate results to create Air Force cultural, technological agility, all that great stuff. But that lead sentence or phrase, a fusion of capabilities. There were some who were like, we're the military. We need to be a team of teams. And then somebody else, we're doing AI. We need to be a system of systems. And in each one, one seemed a little more techie, one seemed a little more human-y. And they're like, do we need to be that constrained? How can we Steve Jobs this? How can we properly Kodak this? And so a fusion of capabilities, that's anything that advances us innovators, accelerating results. And, and you'll see in our structure in just a few more slides, we started with five capabilities, but the year that we get ranked best uh, number 16 in the world for uh, best workplace for innovators, we've got 13 capabilities, largely because we had a very open mindset. If it advances this basic mission, bring it in, bring that capability in. How can we work with it? So watch your words, positively, preferably, simple, positive, flexible words that can have a major impact on your mindset and the development of your culture and how your teams perform. Now, we go back to the famous Abraham Maslow of Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, who begins the expression with, and we could do this one in open chat form, if you only have a hammer, most of your problems are going to start looking like nails, because you've only got one tool in your toolkit. And so uh, how much you have affects the way that you're going to tackle a problem, and that's the tools in the toolkit. Or you can see throughout history, again, back to our hierarchy. Form follows your function. If you've got a strategy and this is the way you're going to do that, well, then we need to make our form match up with the function. Structure follows strategy. Uh, you see these examples again and again in the hierarchy of how this all plays together. But from the, the states, when Henry Ford was kicking out the Model T in the early 1900s, that thing was dominating, right? He had the first major assembly line. He was just rocking it. But then Alfred Sloan comes along and he's like, okay, Ford's got the Model T. But what we're going to do is we're going to have a Chevrolet and over here, we're going to make these really expensive Cadillacs that are like double down in luxury, cushiony seats, leather and all that stuff. So we can lose money here, but we're going to win over here because Ford doesn't have that right now. And so this structure is like one of the first examples of what became known as the multi-divisional firm. It's the whole company, but I've got one division on the cheap car. And then I've got another division on the luxury car. So what Alfred Sloan did actually made General Motors more profitable than Henry Ford during that lifetime. But then when Henry Ford II came along, he then created the multi-divisional structure and then the e equality or parity of production was kind of all being matched up. So a really interesting story, I thought, with regard to how much structure can matter for your performance. And as I had referenced a moment ago, AFWorks, you can see our 13 different things. And yes, you can have the slides when we're done with all of this. So you can see our capabilities. But when we started, we only had like five. <laughs> and so, so as we grew out, we, we developed the story that innovation works because you find where there's a demand, you supply an answer. And then particularly with the government and the military, you've got to bridge all those little technicalities. So we need some capability to help people out with that. So with regard to this part of flow, we hope that you unify your form and function so that you can see how this all links together to keep your strategy and mission on track. Finally, the innermost part of our flow model is the inputs and the processes that are actually getting the work done. And again, we'll go back to Maslow one more time because we use this in AppWorks. Uh, when you wanna climb to the best part of your people out there, you climb up that hierarchy of needs and you get to self-actualization, which uh, we could <laughs> you could debate this for hours. So I'll just give you the working definition that we went with that some version of self-actualization was when people are able to use their strengths, not just because they have to, but because they want to this, I'm using my strengths towards purposeful work. That's going to give me fulfilling energy that I'll want to keep at this. When I can use my strengths towards meaningful, purposeful work, that gives me the kind of fulfillment to make me want to come back again and go at it again. Now, note in my triangle, I actually did include happiness, but not in my discussion because happiness is a side effect. And this is one of those word plays that depends on how you translate, but happiness is short-term and fleeting. Fulfillment is much longer lasting. And if you doubt that, find any adult who has had to change the diaper of a sick kid for the second or third night in a row and everybody's sleep deprived and it's one in the morning and now it's two in the morning and you're rocking and you're, 
Nobody is happy at that point in time. But even as you put your kiddo back to bed at night, and then you kind of get this little grin over your face where you're like, yeah, it's still fulfilling. The little, little guy, the little gal needs me. It's, um, yeah. So happiness, probably not your target, but finding the strengths of your people towards purposeful work, that can create the fulfilling energy that you're looking for. So for me, this is always kind of fun because it's just a fun story. Why am I at tier one? This is the flow model that I had for my different interviews. And when I bumped into tier one, they're like, whoa, we have the same model, except we just start at the individual and work our way out because usually we come in and do some consulting stuff. And then from the people, we work our way out. So I've been giving you from the outside in as a military strategist, but turning around as a consultant, we would say within your people, we can go from the inside out with that. And two other stories. Uh, I believe it was called um, Built to Fail, the story of Blockbuster Video, if you haven't read it. Uh, in there, you'll find a history from somebody who was an actual Blockbuster uh, store owner who can tell you from the different memos and stuff. Blockbuster actually had a chance to buy Netflix at the time. The people, the inputs, the processes that they were like, hey, we recommend you take a look at maybe buying Netflix. Nope, said the leadership. And then there was, hey, you could buy Redbox too before it was called Redbox. Uh, so those kiosks that you might find in the discount stores as you're going in and out where you could grab a DVD. Nope. No flexibility in the mission and strategy of Blockbuster and an 8,000 store, $8 billion market capitalization disappeared with time and went bankrupt as well. So pay attention to your people. They might have some mighty good ideas. Processes. John J. Chapman, one of the great ones. All progress is experimental. That's a winning quote. Uh, some easy ones where you're like, well, I don't know exactly what it will do, but part of the reason that we have training out there is we want to upskill our people to achieve better things. Or, classic business example, 3M saying to its scientists, its lab people, hey, 15% of your time during the week, work on what you want. And maybe something great comes out of it. Maybe we can co-patent it. Maybe you can make a little extra money with your invention. All these different things. So if you look up the story of the Post-it note, and Spencer Silver, and then Art Fry also helping with marketing and production stuff. Uh, pretty amazing stuff about what it means to have an open environment where people can work on things that interest them, not just what the central idea is. And funny thing also about the Post-it Note, wasn't a huge success the first year they launched it. Uh, they redid some stuff, Idaho, the rest is history, but it's important to note that even when you've got the winner that history looks back on and says, of course, in the moment, it might have been a I don't know, maybe. So uh, keep some humility as you, you turn out your product. But I can tell you when we were running AppWorks, this was one of our fun times when we would come together for what we called our common mind sessions. And here we would have like, um, we would take one of these assessments that you see before you, and then we would put up everybody's score on the board because we weren't worried about the privacy thing. We were all just one big, just amazing people. And you'd be like, wow, you're really strong in this but about a third of us are really strong in this and that's not particularly compatible. So how do we change our emails or put together our meetings so that we can have these different personality types and strengths and what can we do so that we can work better as a team? So uh, we did a lot where we tapped into our strengths and it was a, it was a deliberate uh, organizational learning tool as well as individual learning to take some of these tests. And then finally, lastly, within our flow, you've got all these things that are working together is it actually effective? And for that, you have to look at the outputs, the user feedback, and what comes with it. So one simple piece of output that you go with is return on investment, or ROI. And we had a great story uh, during my third year in particular. I remember going to the briefings at the Pentagon where the amazing Afworksians out in Las Vegas and in conjunction with some of the members at the bases, for seven years, the Air Force had taken two different attempts with coming up with a new helmet for the, the pilots of the Air Force. Seven years, $7 million, zero prototypes that anybody wanted to invest money in. And so they came to us. I'm not saying they thought we were the greatest thing. We might've just been the, well, let's try something different at least. And uh, in seven months and for under a million dollars, we did a crowdsourcing activity. Um, under a million dollars when all was said and done, 37 different companies came in. We had three different groups that uh, ultimately got selected for testing. And in the end, it was Lyft that got picked up and you can read about them in popular command, uh, mechanics. They're putting together these helmets, they're finishing up the tests and they should be live in the field and growing out this year. So kind of exciting stuff with that. And 
this is not a commercial for idea scale, but it just crossed my mind. Lizzie had never met me prior to this adventure. Uh, we actually used idea scale as part of our crowdsourcing software during our startup years. So it's kind of funny how it all comes back around, but that but there's value in using your people to generate and build out better ideas. Also, uh, with regard to feedback, there's the, the dollar value, but then you can just take your surveys along the way. And we had different things where we had public affairs taking surveys with us. And uh, originally on the left, AppWorks and innovation, maybe it's just a buzzword, it's just some general's idea from the Pentagon. And in the end, it was like, wow, these people are kind of innovative and collaborative. So uh, really proud of what the AppWorks 1.0 group did during 2017 through 2020 to build out innovation for the Air Force. And of course, at the bottom, you've got your events, you get 100 people showing up and over 80% or 80% like what you're doing, you're probably on, on track and you can tweak as you need to. Also, of course, though, feedback, you got to do your internal feedback. So the employee net promoter score, the ENPS, that was something we did. And the reason I'm kind of proud of this one is uh, this was taken in March of 2020, before we had any idea, before anybody had put us in for an award or anything. So in the summer is when we would get that number 16 rating from Fast Company. We didn't know that in March. And I remember sending out this one and I was just like, hey, how's everybody doing? I know we're working 50, 60 hours and man, I think the statute of limitations has passed. So there were people who probably weren't clocking in the amount of time that they were contributing to the team. Uh, and so you just ask the question, I would recommend AppWorks as a place for others to work because I know we're all working, pulling the sled hard. And uh, of the 40-ish people, 95% yes, 5% neutral, and zero no's. And frankly, now looking at it, I'm glad that there were two people who were like, meh, <laughs> with the neutral because it was hard. Because I feel if it had been 100% yes, you'd be like, I don't believe your survey. But that was, that was actual feedback that we got from running our survey with the team. So same concepts as before for sense and respond. You know, you want to measure to live better. OKR, smart goals, internal surveys, and things like that, all part of your flow process. So rounding our final lap here, what we're talking about is how can we take all these things together? How can we achieve from all these different data points? How can we make a major impact? And I can tell you that AFWorks, while we knew we were going into an uncertain future filled with VUCA, we drew upon a lot of different science, literature, spirituality, all these different items so that we could try and create something effective. And uh, it worked out well there. But at the global level, this may not be even a, an ethical experiment where like you could never do this, but pick up post-World War II, the Korean Peninsula, war-torn nation. And so essentially two bombed out groups of people and one half has to live in the south and one half ends up living in the north. Under the north, you have communist dictatorship. Under the south, you have de democratic capitalism uh, in different forms, of course. And uh, you can go to your web server and you can just type in North Korea, South Korea at night, image, and you will get something like you see here. And so which of these systems with 75 years and an equal starting point of being a war-torn country which of these systems to you looks like it has the right mission, strategy, the ability to adapt to an environment? Yep, competition, much like with innovation, not everybody wins all the time. But which culture says try and do better? Which culture seems to produce more energy so that at night things are lit up? Uh, and if you want to put a number to it, I looked up at the U.S. Patent and Trade Office. Hey, how many unique ideas are there out of North Korea now that we patent and say, wow, that's we should protect that. That's a really unique contribution to the world. They should get their money for it. And then how many are there for South Korea? Well, uh, it's now down to zero for North Korea, whereas South Korea is actually number four in the globe, 23,197 uh, patents registered within the, the United States. So uh, those two different systems, they do seem to matter. And uh, it all lines up at a flow national level as well. Now, in conclusion, my friends, please remember, uh, number one, if you're one of those hip and jiggy people, hipsters who can do the QR code, fantastic. Please take a shot uh, because if you do the QR code, that's going to take you to the item on the left, which is we got a deck of cards at tier one, adaptive intelligence questions, 52 cards. So you can do one a week for a year. Just you can do that for your lunch and learn if you want to build up your adaptive intelligence skill. Uh, in the middle, Again, we were a learning organization, adaptive intelligence during our startup years. It's super cool to look back for us 
uh, we put together a monstrous PDF. It's like 80 plus pages. All the people who were working on AppWorks 1.0. So if you're kind of new and kind of struggling and you just want to you just want to commiserate with somebody with with empathetic solidarity. Uh, send me an email or something and I'll find this because I don't know if you can find it on the web like you used to be able to. But we have our AFWorks 1.0 book that we all put together, which is pretty cool of them. And then for myself, uh, in reflection, I put together the flow model book uh, that's out there on Amazon and stuff like that. But um, So in conclusion, my friends, uh, with adaptive intelligence flow, hopefully you're able to see how you can emerge in the complex environment with greater capability to sense and shape the future, which expands the uh, window of opportunities that you can see. And it might even along you, allow you to bring along a few more people and a few more allies. Uh, that's our third rescue kitty. That is a snowball right there. And so one last time, I'll give you the QR code in case you are interested in those um, cards. And uh, otherwise, I see that there's a Q&A question forming, uh, things in the chat. Uh, while this is going on, please feel free. If you have a lesson from a childhood game that you want to throw in the chat, do that as well. And uh, my email, or you can find me on LinkedIn, is in the lower left there. And with that, I will stop sharing. And uh, Lizzie, if you want to help out with some Q&A or anything else, um, this concludes my formal presentation. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. That was great. And I haven't seen the pictures of your cats before, but they're very cute. Thank you. We're kind of proud. <laughs> Biased, but proud. I think that this um this question came in and then you did provide an example, but we'll just do in case you have another one too. Um, are you able to share any exa examples of innovation successes from your work with AppWorks? Oh yeah, okay, yep. So definitely the um the the helmet was like the easiest one that you could do an ROI with because they had tried one method and it, and it just rolls off the tongue, right? Seven years, seven million dollars, zero. Seven months, less than a million. 37 companies, three testable prototypes that came out of it. That, that was that was the easiest story to tell from there. Uh, after that, it all gets kind of spooky because you start down one path and then it changes and it iterates. But that was one that I could give you that had definite numbers associated with it. That was great. And um, for, we got one in the chat over here. Um, what are your top ways to achieve leadership buy-in for organizations that maybe aren't as innovative as the Air Force? We found, and I see this in the consulting world as well, and we were uh, human-centric design and design thinkers within our innovation team. If you have a leader who seems a little more rigid, you start by saying, and, and you just work it in subtly over a lunch meeting or even in your parting out, like, oh, what is a problem for you? And when they point out their problem and they offer their pain point, and then if you have some of the design thinking or other tools associated with it, you can take their problem and say, well, would you like that problem fixed? And, and it's like, well, let's get together because for me, and I will say this as a at one time slightly cynical, they say that economics is the dismal science. I don't think I'm dismal, but I would agree that economists can be kind of pessimists. The first time I went to a design thinking session in 2017, I remember thinking there were like 16 of us, and we were supposed to help out the general build up a drone war simulation because drones are a real thing in combat. And uh, by the time we got done, it shifted from being drone racing to perimeter security around a base. And as I got on the plane that evening, and it had been two days in Las Vegas time zones and stuff, I remember we're flying back with a couple of the teammates and it's like, well, well, we could have come up with that on our own. True, but the magic of that design thinking session is when you bring the leader in and the leader gets to contribute, now all 17 of us in that room, by the end, all signed off on a piece of paper that we said, it is these nine things, it is this, and Bob's going to do this, and Athena's going to do that, and Zeus is going to do this, and it's like everybody's engaged and fired up to contribute. So um, yeah, using the design thinking, bringing people together so that everybody gets a voice in it. It's just so much different than the classic military model of here's what we need to do. Go execute. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Executing it. Not the same human spirit at all. Yeah. And it definitely is easier to innovate in general, even just breaking down like the bureaucracy. Sounds like that's a great way to do that. Yes, ma'am. And speaking of like challenges, um, did you have a top challenge or maybe even a few if you faced a lot um, while launching AFWorks? Or did you have enough support that it wasn't you didn't run into too many? We had 
I want to say again, the statute of limitations has passed, so I don't think there'll be any <laughs> federal investigators knocking on my door. But there's a reason I'm a thousand miles from the Pentagon now. No. Uh, <laughs> we definitely had more than a few uh, rough starts with some members of the legal team, not because they were fuddy duddies, but you would have, you would have, example, hey, we wanted to buy lunch for people as they came together for these, you know, 150 people come together to work on a helmet or something like that. We're going to have lunch because if people go off and they do their lunch, 90 minutes is lost. Now everybody comes back on time. People pick up their cell phones. Now you've lost two hours. Part of the magic of the grand innovation design thinking session is everybody stays together. And then when you're sitting back over food, it's much easier to be creative because you're not stressed like, oh, I got to fill out my whiteboard in 15 minutes, but you're just sitting around. Um, Unless the rules have changed dramatically, we would find out later as we got our hands slapped. Typically, I got my hands slapped multiple times for you brought food. How did you how did you determine that? They, so are you the government? Are you trying to buy favor with a company? We had one group that was nice enough to buy napkins before I knew better. <laughs> because of the napkins, because it was sponsored by a group that was also apparently thousands of miles away bidding on a satellite contract. People are like, you're giving undue favor. I'm like, are you serious? Dude, it's a napkin. I don't even know anybody in the company. They were nice enough through a third party vendor to say, hey, just donate it to those patriots. They're trying to get something done for democracy. Here's some free napkins. Nope, you shall not give the government anything without being seen as some sort of influence peddler. So yes, I would say you need to find the right group of lawyers who can work with you as a team and find ways to say yes. Because if not, there are some traditional people who think that, and it's their job to be the pessimist that everything could be a potential front page scandal. But I'm pretty sure $200 worth of napkins <laughs> would not have hit the front of the New York Times like other scandals have. But yeah, I, I think that that's probably a common issue with the government employees, but difficult yeah. one. Um, we'll answer one last question and I think we'll wrap things up. Um, we have someone say they're an innovation specialist at a science agency with an economist as a supervisor and struggle with communicating that they're not a publishing researcher. What are your ways to explain the role and accomplishments of innovators in innovative thinking? Well, yeah, wow. And you've got an economist leader. You know? <laughs> um, definitely the ROI, but you're probably going to have to look up different versions of because of this innovation this much money was saved and so that's going to require additional um, homework because you can't just say that's a really cool knickknack you have to say that really cool knickknack saves an average of 10 hours a week per 100 people on this team which is a thousand hours per month which is actually fifty thousand dollars in savings blah, blah blah like you have to yeah the biggest thing, and that's why ROI was actually the lead off on the feedback, you have to be able to somehow convert things to dollars so people can understand and pitch it. Um, another thing that we did is we said, by expanding our ecosystem with the venture capital community, we could then track some of our inventions. And you could see that through what was called CIBR dollars, Small Business Innovation Research Funds, I believe it was, SBIR funds, uh, you could see that companies plus the Air Force CIBR dollars combined together, we could say things like, you know, over for every dollar spent by the government, three dollars was spent by private industry to advance this program. So it's like us getting a 75 percent discount. So um, doing your homework and finding ways to find the cost benefit analysis. And typically it's finding the cost savings versus profit because we're not a profit organization in the government, but finding the cost savings dollars that usually uh, provides a lot of good momentum. I find. Great. All right, and that will end things for today. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a great presentation. Um, and we will send out the links afterwards. Yes, there's a couple of people in the chat asking about it. Um, we'll send out the links to um, what being linked to in the webinar recording email. So keep an eye out for that. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for joining. This was great. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.